Welcome to Get Found, Search Engine Optimization and Conversion. I'm Dante St. James taking you through this this afternoon or sort of working into this evening if you're on the east coast of Australia. Um, I'm in Darwin, so it's still plenty of sunshine here and still plenty of daylight left. Um, and if you're on the west coast, well, you beat me all over it. So let's get underway and let's explore the world of SEO in the most plain English way that we possibly can. I'll share my screen and we'll get it started. Now, don't forget you've got options to uh, get onto the chat window if you've got a question along the way. You've also got the Q&A. If you're watching this after the fact at YouTube, just whack those comments in down below and uh, I'll be able to answer those. And while you're there, just start like and then subscribe and then hit the notification bell just so you can get notified whenever these come through. Um, for those of you who are watching live right now, this will be recorded and placed on YouTube a little bit later this evening. Uh, it should be around about an hour after I'm done with it. It'll be uh, placed on YouTube so you can watch it again, either through my own channel, Dante St. James, or through the Business Station channel on YouTube. A quote from Jim Whalen, who has worked in a lot of SEO and marketing firms in her time, says a good SEO work only gets better over time. It's only the search engine tricks that need to keep changing when the rank ranking algorithms change. We often hear about algorithms, don't we? Wow. It's the algorithm's fault. The algorithm did it. Oh, it's going fine until the algorithm. But when it comes down to it, if you're following very, very broad and general and proven techniques to improve your position on Google, you don't have to use tricks. You don't have to use tips. You don't have to use black hat and gray hat techniques. You just have to do the right things and keep doing them over a period of time. So in this session, we're going to look at how websites work, how Google works, how to build websites then with all that in mind. So search engine optimization is what we're after. And we want to look at how websites work, how Google works with those websites, and then how you can then improve your web position with those in mind. So let's have a look at how websites work. This is real 101 stuff. It's all about your website address. If you do have a .com.au, it's kind of like, it's your address. It's where it is. So you buy one of those and that connects through to a web host. And that web host gives you space in their servers that connects that domain name through to a space on their web server. That's then where you host your pages of your website and they're accessed via your domain. So the domain points to a web server, which then has a specific space allocated to your address or your domain on their servers. So that's really as complicated as websites get. But Google then works in a slightly different way. Google works in the form of the spider and the web. So Google is like a spider that goes around a web and picking up whatever has landed on that overnight. So it looks for changes. It looks for things that have been added. It looks for anything it needs to update the index that it's got. And it takes that new information and it processes it in such a way that it decides whether it's going to then uh, increase the rank of a website or decrease the rank of a website or whatever it needs to do in order to get a better result for the people who are searching on the system. Now, that's the issue when it comes down to Google is it's geared towards not businesses, but it's geared towards people using the system and finding it useful and finding the stuff that they want to be able to find when they want to find it. There are a bunch of ranking factors, and these are really important to know because they tell you pretty much everything you need to know about probably why your email, well, your um, particular website is not ranking all that well. So first of all, we look at the trust level of your website. That's something that you earn over time. It's something which you can't force. It's something that you can't nurture. It's just something that comes with being there over time. It's like saying that you've opened up a brand new department store in the back suburbs of, um, of Brisbane and no one's ever heard of it, but you think you deserve to rank better on Google for department stores in Brisbane than Meyer or David Jones. Then we look secondly at how popular your website or page is. Now, these guys are all ranked. So these balls, the size of the ball gives you an idea of how much this is weighted. So the trust level is the highest weighting. Then the popularity is the second uh, highest rating. And that weighting is all about basically people consistently coming to your site over time and large numbers of them as well. So that's what you need to really, really looking at is not just the trust level, not just how popular, but then also the how popular you are in terms of links coming back to you. We call them backlinks. 
that number of and relevance of links to your website or your web page is a major ranking factor in there. And it does control when it comes down to it, the difference between two very, very similar businesses with similar presences, similar amount of time online and a similar level of traffic. The one that has the more backlinks will then be the one that's generally ranked above. If those backlinks are relevant, not just any old backlink, not just anything from lots of different like dodgy, you know, Bangladesh websites and directories. It has to be something that's relevant to that particular business. And then we look at how well you've optimized your site or your page to be indexed. This is the stuff that you can do on the website that helps you to be better found by Google, better understood by Google, for Google to better be able to index you in their list. Then we look at things like the quality of your domain registration and web host hosting in these days. The quality of the web um, the, the web hosting is very important, not so much the domain registration. Unless you book your domain through someone who is particularly known to be bad, then it might be something like, um, for instance, booking a domain that's uh, .xxx is not going to help you out. But it also, also could be to do with the kinds of domain name you've registered. A .com or a .com.au is going to be registered well above a .biz or a .media or a .marketing or a .club. It's those new top level domains don't yet have the authority or the, the credibility apart from being sold to mostly people who are trying to do either network marketing schemes or a lot of Bitcoin mining and kind of that sort of stuff. Then we're looking at the performance of your page for visitors. By performance, we'll look at that shortly. It means pages that load fast, get people to where they want to be and get them the information they want in the format that they're looking for it. Finally, it's then up to your social media links, your mentions and your reputation, things like reviews, that kind of stuff will all be compiled into something that then adds that little bit of extra spice to where you rank on Google. Now, this is always like, um, a, a game of golf, I imagine. So how would you then prepare for a perfect round of golf? You would then try and work on each one of those baubles. So the first, so you go back there, we want to work on these in order of what they come in. So first of all, you'll start working on the trust level by consistently matching what people are looking for and doing that over an extended period of time. I'm not talking about doing this over three months. I'm talking about doing this over years. This kind of level is reached over years of consistent activity that you're putting into it. Then looking at how popular a website is, you can't just attract people through an ads campaign to flood your website with 1,000 hits in one day and then go back to the normal 30 hits a day directly after it. What Google sees is that was due to a very unusual spike in traffic, but in no way shows how, imp how popular your page is over a period of time. They don't look at averages, they look for consistency. So you've got to not just attract more people to your page, but you've got to keep attracting them time after time after time. When we're looking at the relevance of the links to your site or page, we're looking at mentions from other websites. So it allows you to cultivate links from things like articles, from blogs, from news articles, particularly from reputable news sources. Like them or hate them, news.com.au does produce a lot of traffic to websites. And if you are mentioned on, on news.com.au, it is a very powerful engine to help you grow your website's popularity. You can also operate in forums and groups where you can uh, then lead people to come through to your site. Now, it's not necessarily going to index your, um, your links in those groups. Groups, what it does do is generate a little bit of extra traffic. And if Google can see there's a significant amount of traffic coming to your site from those extra sources, then they're going to be in a position to say, hey, something's going on here. This looks like it's got a backlink that we can't necessarily read, but it's definitely coming from that site. The performance of your page for visitors is about those visitors finding relevant desired information, the stuff that they're actually looking for and they find it fast and you've made it so it's very easy for them to find that information. This is so that not just fast, it's all about convenience. It's about the information being in a format that they're looking for. If somebody is an audio oriented person and you have an audio result for them, you will rank high for that person. If someone is a more video oriented person, then they will rank higher when you provide a video result for them. If they're more of a reader or there's someone who's looking for very much dot points and very, very concise information, if you provided that, 
you will rank higher for them because of what their behavior is like when they normally search for things online. So this is not just based upon one rule that you do once and that affects your search with everybody. Search is a much, much, much more complicated beast than that. And my Google is very different to your Google, is very different to your neighbor's Google, which is very different to their cousin's Google. Everyone sees a very different Google depending upon their own behaviors when it comes to search. Otherwise, we're all getting the same results. We wouldn't be getting the results we want to get and Google would be kind of useless to us. When it comes to those social media links, mentions and reputations, it's all about the traffic that's coming in from your social media posts, but not ranking the actual posts themselves. That's actually a violation of privacy and it breaks the rules of um, all of the so all of the social media platforms really it's all about your brand also being mentioned on social media so some of the more open social media like reddit which can be indexed by google and twitter which can be indexed by google to a degree it's all about them being having your mentions in there not just like you doing stuff on social media it's about other people mentioning you on social media that provides an opportunity to show that people are mentioning you, you're popular and you're being referred to and also recommendations and reviews on all those different review sites from TripAdvisor to Yelp to pretty much anywhere you're going to see a solid amount of recommendations or reviews held, except for maybe Facebook because those aren't shared with Google. Then we look at how well you've optimized your site or your page to be indexed. So that's using the correct style of using titles and paragraphs finding simple structures to follow through your website. So it's very easy for someone to look at a page, follow logically organized information, which links through to other places where they can go to find out more. And it's very simple and quick for them to find that out. Using things like structured data. So structured data is using things like dot points, um, numbered points, lists, that kind of thing that allow um, not just people, but also the search engines to easily index information in a nice bite-sized format that they can show also in their search results. And then asking things in the form of questions and answers. So we're gonna look at a lot more of that very soon where you'll get an idea of just how we're gonna do that whole question and answer thing and make it so much easier for you to work with. Now, when it comes to the quality of domain registration and web hosting, don't think too much of your domains apart from trying to stick to .coms and .com.au's if you can. Going for those .biz and .media and .marketing and .this and .that, they're not going to be very helpful to you and they're considered to be quite spammy in, in reality because they're just not used that much. .co and .co.nz, those are not too bad. .co is not regarded as particularly bad, um, but it's still not as good as .com or .com.au. So you'll find that if you're up against someone who has the .com or the .com.au of your version, and they are also in Australia, they're just about always going to rank ahead of you until such time that you can prove over a long period of time that you are a, um, a trustworthy source and you are a high authority source of what you're looking at. Um, you also want to host close to your target audience. So if you're using things like um, GoDaddy, for instance, Instance, most of your traffic is going to come out of America uh, and it's just not close to where your target audience is if you're targeting searches in Australia for instance cheaper is not better hence why GoDaddy and net registry and all those guys are terrible web hosts they are, as someone who builds websites I've built on them and my goodness they are terrible to work with their their software is out of date they don't really take it that seriously because they're really all about getting those domain sales that's where they really make their big money from especially GoDaddy who are kind of like the kings of when it comes to um building and trusting and, and trading in domain names and and the and the, the market around that so make sure you try and host close to where your target is. If they're in Australia, host within Australia. There's some great web hosts that I can suggest to you later on. That's all very well. That's a lot of information. And you're probably just sitting there going, holy crap, what am I going to do with all that? Well, it's probably better off for you trying to go for the things that you can actually do yourself. So the things you can do for yourself that really help is ensuring that your Google My Business profile is completed. If you've got empty parts of that, if you haven't filled everything out, if things aren't consistently placed, if you don't have a phone number or an email address or a link to a website or a list of your products and services on Google My Business, you're losing out on traffic. 
the more data points you can give to Google, the more reason they've got to show you ahead of others in that knowledge panel on the desktop that's over on the right. So if someone searches for your business particularly and they don't find you, that's because your Google My Business profile is pretty much pointless to anyone and doesn't necessarily contain even old information that's out of date. It's just completely useless to anyone searching. Having a fast, well-structured, simply built website will go a long, long way because that's ultimately where Google is looking for the best part of the information of your business. They're not going to find it from the yellow pages. They'll find a few little bits and pieces from there. But what they're really looking for is a well-structured and fast to load, mobile-friendly and consumer-friendly website that contains lots of information that's well-structured and well-set out in bite-sized pieces that people can consume easily. It's also good to find content that's easy to consume and find, whether that's on your website or whether you're using that across different places like Medium or posting on Blogger or something like that. And also content that's written for the guest, not written for you. So it's very easy for you to go, oh, we've been around for 37 years, a family owned business, locally owned and operated. Nobody really cares for that when they're looking. No one, like literally nobody is going onto Google and searching for, I'm looking for a family owned mechanic in Emerald in Queensland. No one's looking for that. They're just looking for mechanic Emerald or they're looking for plumber Perth. They're not looking for family owned, 100% Australian owned, any of that sort of stuff, that's not really factoring into their choices until such time they're lining you up all against each other, comparing you on your websites or comparing the shop frontage that you got on the street and decide that's the one I'm going to go to. You're also looking at content that answers questions. People have tons of questions. That's what we go to Google about these days. We don't necessarily go looking for what were the previously, the, 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 the search strings that we used to do. Now what we're doing is typing questions in or even more than often or not, we're actually asking the big G questions directly to our phones and saying, you know, hey G, where is the closest Chinese restaurant? Hey G, when does Kmart close? That kind of thing. So content that answers questions that can be easily packaged and sent back up to Google is much better placed on Google and helps you to get much better search results. Considering too, that 61% of all searches that happen on Google these days do not result in a click through to a website. That's scary. So you either complain about it or you go, you know what, I'm going to take advantage of this and be the person who provides that information. So I become the authority in my area for searches for that particular thing. So it could be that you want to be, you're mowing grass in, let's just throw in Logan City in Queensland, right? So you, you, you're a lawnmower and you go around and you mow lawns in Logan. You want to be much, much higher rated than the others. And there's a lot of like gyms mowing and all those sort of guys. Look, you may not beat them, but you can get very close to them, particularly if people are searching for you in a specific location. They're looking for you in, say, we're going to think of a suburb now, Logan Home in, in Brisbane and in, in Logan in Queensland, right? So looking for lawnmowers in Logan Home. And if you show up as a lawnmower in Logan Home specifically, you've got content written around about that. You're answering questions about lawn care in Logan Home you will automatically start to climb the rankings because you've got the appropriate content on your website that matches what people are looking for. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, if everyone's creating all this content, everyone's creating all this relevant content, that you've got to find your niche. So not everyone's creating that, that content that talks about mowing lawns in Logan City. They might be saying lawn mowing services in Southeast Queensland, lawn mowing services in the Bridgeman metropolitan area, lawn mowing services in the Gold Coast or Ipswich or something like that. What we're talking about is getting much more hyper than that. You want to get things that are so close to you. So you may be lawn mowing in Shaler Park, Logan, Brisbane, Queensland, that sort of thing. It's getting really, really close to the place you're looking at rather than trying to appeal to those great big searches that are just not questions that you're ever going to win because Jim's mowing has that one. Having a completed Google My Business profile means going to business.google.com and ensuring that you actually own the, the, the property. You own your property on Google and you have access to it and you can post to it. So having all your contact details and your website um, address on there, your hours of trade, your 
tours or your experiences or your products or your services listed as well. Um, here you're showing the Catherine Outback experience in the Northern Territory, who's showing that they've got their horse riding experience and Outback show listed there. So people can click on there to find more about the pricing and all that without ever having to leave Google. And once they do want to go and book it, you can guarantee that they're going to click on your website to book those experiences. So you can update your hours as well for things like holidays. So the upcoming, um, some areas of Queensland have got a public holiday on the 26th of April. Some don't. Um, I think Queensland, Northern Territory and Western Australia do. So um, if you do, then you should be updating that and making sure that you knowing that you may be closed at that time, adding photos, adding videos, answering reviews that people have got on there, thanking people for their reviews, saying sorry if they've had a bad experience, acknowledging that sort of thing, and posting and answering questions. There's questions that can be posted on a Google My Business profile by the public. You can actually post those questions yourself and answer them yourself. That becomes an extra Q&A section outside of your website. They can help you to gain more of those searches in some of that thing that those things that you're very very um you know very well connected to your homework then when it comes to google my business is making sure number one you've got a google my business profile and secondly looking at what needs to be added to make your profile much much more effective and full of information so there, take a screenshot of that because that's your homework. And that's how you're going to then be able to move beyond where you're at, at right now in Google My Business to move to a much more successful profile. Doing your own SEO work can also involve helping to build a faster, more well-structured website. You need your website to load in under five seconds. That homepage, if it takes more than five seconds to load, it's too slow and you're going to find that nearly 80% of potential customers are dropping off. Even if it's over three seconds to load, that's too slow for some people. So you can use lots of site speed plugins. If you're using WordPress, for example, um, you can use Cloudflare, which is a service which accepts accelerates your website for free and also puts a lot of security stuff in front of it. You remove things like front page videos, having videos that are loading in automatically and playing in a background on your website may look very pretty, but when someone picks up their mobile phone and tries to read it and it's slow to load because of your video, that's not a good experience for them. The vid, no one's impressed by your video except for other businesses. The people who want to buy from you, they're not impressed by it. Um, getting rid of things like slideshows. Nobody is sitting there wanting to slide through your slideshow. That's a thing that's a hangover from the early 2000s, back when nobody was using mobile phones to access the web. Get rid of those slideshows. Get rid of the videos from the front page and use a good heading and paragraph structure. Heading, paragraph, subheading, paragraph, heading, paragraph. So it's very easy for not only people to follow through what the important points are, because we tend to skim through websites. We don't sit there and be absolutely enthralled by the writing skills of the person who was on that website. But we do, we skim, we scam. We're looking for the base information and we find that out in headings and the first part of the paragraph, right? then using things like not cramming everything on the front page. You don't have to say everything on the front page. You just have to say enough. And we can go into more detail about that another time in another session about what exactly a good front page does look like. So in your homework for this one, you want to look at the, what are your, what's your website built with? And is it fast? Is it slow? What you could remove to make your site faster and a lot more usable? In a lot of cases, it's just too many photos, too many videos, slideshows, all those things that don't really give any value to the person visiting, but they make you kind of feel good about you having a pretty website. Pretty websites are great and then and all websites should look good, but they primarily need to answer the question that the person who's visiting that website is looking to have answered and make it easy for them to find that information. Doing your own SEO work also means finding, making um, things on your site easy to find and easy to consume. So things like short paragraphs of text backed up by dot points for your features or dot points for your descriptions rather than great big banks of text is what's going to help that too long didn't read or TLDR as the kids call it these days uh, is going to stop people from reading and actually filling filling in what they need to find out about your business or your products break your information up your top experiences 
Um, can your top your, your products or services or experiences can be linked from the front page, but don't necessarily have more than five top level menu items on the front page. When you're going for six, seven, eight, ten menu items across the top there, it's too much stuff for people to choose from, and too much choice actually equals paralysis. People just don't know what to choose, and they go, "I don't know, it's too hard. I'm going to go back and look at someone simpler." A lot of the new websites these days have less items in the menu, even down to at least three then have a few sub menu items but the thing is to have a quality of information on your website not a quantity of it you're not necessarily trying to create a library here you're not necessarily trying to build a a new um, a new encyclopedia britannica what you're doing is providing easy to consume information that is about your business what you do who it's for and how that relates to the person who's searching for you so what you would need to do to help this is write a blurb for one of your products using a format in the format of a product, a short paragraph, dot points or features, and expansion information, which means a title, a very short a paragraph about that particular service or thing you're talking about, a few dot points, three at the least, up to five at the most of what the features are of that particular product. And then you can expand on those particular features uh, in more paragraphs of text. But you want to get that first, the top of that, that article of that, type, that page and that text that say contain everything that anyone needs. They can scan on the product name. They scan through that short paragraph. They scan down through those dot points. Most of that should be all they need. Once they get to the expansion information, that's only for people who are digging a lot deeper. When you're considering to do your own SEO work, you have to consider writing for the guest or writing for the customer. You need to focus on what's in it for them, not what's so great about you. Whilst it can be very, very tempting to say that we've been around for 35 years and we've got the best coffee beans in town and we roast them on site, that's all about you. That's not talking about the benefits to the actual customer. So what you need to talk in terms of is you will, you have, you are, um, a, a very good for someone who's writing for the guests. So they, you're writing about them. So you're saying you will have a great time in this restaurant. You have the chance to enjoy great food, great coffee and great times. You are the center of everything we're about to do. And likewise, you can book here. A lot of mentioning them, you, that sort of stuff is much more helpful than going and listing off features and benefits in great paragraphs of information that you've written about how great you are. Kim's just asked for an Australian website. Is a .com a new domain name better than a .com? And what if you're thinking scaling international at some point? If you're looking to scale international, start with a .com. It's not really going to have a great deal of difference between a .com and a .au. In fact, if anything, own both and have the .com as the primary one with a .com.au redirecting through to it. Considering that um, the, the domain names cost as little as $22 a year now, it kind of makes sense to buy the ones you think are going to be the most, especially if it's your brand brand name you're using in that it's better for you to own all the versions of that brand name rather than letting someone else get hold of them and sort of get ahead of you so in this case you would look look you can look at one website to see how it can be improved by writing for the customer and this can be one of those things that's really really helpful in helping you see how many businesses get this really really wrong by writing very much towards what's so great about them and not what's what the, what the, what they're providing to the person who's searching for their services and products it's a very subtle change to write for someone else rather than writing for yourself we like it naturally we think that the whole um, point of promotion is telling everyone all about ourselves but what it is is actually more about telling someone else what is so great about them and why they should then be able to get that pro that issue they need solved through you it's one of those things which you can um you can find a lot more through um, the book from Donald Miller called Building a Story Brand. It's a great book that allows you to be able to, I uh, guess, go through that process of writing for the audience, not writing for yourself. That's called Creating a Story Brand by Do Donald Miller. And every month I do one of these um, story brands uh, sessions that helps you to sort of understand that and to swing around your whole point of view from I do all this and look at me, I'm wonderful too. This person needs help. What can I do to, pre to pre present my products and services to them in a way that presents them as solutions to the problems that they have? 
when you're doing your own SEO work, you might uh, want to consider answering questions. So in this case, I've got one here for a Kakadu National Park where I've gone, okay, where can I stay in Kakadu? Now there's a number of options that come up. One of them's for Kakadu Tourism, which is actually a commercial company that um, is uh, owned or well, managed by Accor Hotels. They have a couple of accommodation venues in Kakadu, including a cultural center they manage as well. Now, the problem with that is, of course, that it only mentions their properties. They're not going to mention the Ambenic Kakadu Resort or the, the Graveside Gorge Campground or the Kuinda or the uh, Jarajin uh, Campground. They're just going to mention their own places, which is the Kakadu Crocodile Hotel in Jabiru and the Kuinda Campground and Caravan Park and Hotel in Kuinda, because that's the ones they own. So the one that comes up first is this answer for Parks Australia, who manages the access and all the, all the facilities in Kakadu National Park. And that's the one that comes up first because it contains the most authoritative and complete list of all those things. So you, you can leverage off that is to identify what the top 10 questions are that your customers ask you. And then look at the top 10 questions you wish your customers or clients would ask you and then write content that fits that. If someone's always asking you, um, what colors are available in this line of clothing that's a that's that's a perfect idea for a blog where you can go um we have a lot you want to answer the questions that people have been asking you so they don't actually have to ask you those questions it's actually really awkward for someone to go through the process usually of asking someone in a shop or someone in a business a question about products because we know darn well that what's going to happen is that that person is going to go on a high sales high sales high stress high pressure spiel to try and get us to buy something we don't actually want so if you can help them avoid those questions, it makes you a much better trader because they've now got the information they want and they can just go and buy. It makes it so much easier. I, when, I, when I go to buy something, I've usually researched it already and I just walk into the shop if I have to go to a shop and go, I'm like this. Okay, they go, oh, okay, no worries. That's it. Yep, thanks. Bye. And I'm out. And it's such a smooth, friendly, nice experience where I don't have to get someone to bear their soul to me just to sell me something that I don't necessarily need or want. So your homework with that would be to identify what those top 10 things are. What are the top 10 things your customers are asking you? What are the top 10 things that you wish that they would ask you? And also, and Wendy brought this up too, things such as what people are asking in Google. The problem is what people are asking in Google. The top things they're asking in Google are already answered by 50,000 other websites. So trying to work off those ones is going to be a bit of a losing attempt because you don't have the momentum that a lot of the bigger websites do who have answered those questions. So if you try to answer all those top things like, what's the best Chinese restaurant in town? And there's about 50 of them. And, you know, you've, you've already, you know, you, you've come in very late to the game as a Chinese restaurant, then it's going to be really hard for you to get yourself listed as one of the top restaurants in town for Chinese cuisine. It's going to take you a lot longer to get to the point of being ranking for that than what these existing people will be. But if you go for the best Chinese restaurant in a particular suburb in your town or um, the best place to get a particular Chinese meal, so cha choy, uh, no, the thing of Peking duck or something like that, you could be the best place to get Peking duck in your town because no one else has actually identified that. And that's the difference between what they call a short tail and a long tail search query short tail is all about the obvious questions it doesn't take you long to get there it's short but the long tail stuff is the stuff that people are asking less often and what happens at these particular queries such as where's the best place to get peking duck that sort of question is very very specific and comes with a much higher intent people are going in there with a much much more um much more intentional um way to try and look for what they're looking for and they're going in with an intent to buy or an intent to really investigate that as an option so when they're just looking for um chinese restaurant in paramount in new south wales they might just be looking out of general research for something they're going to do in a couple of days but when they're looking for something really really spectacularly specific like Peak, peaking duck in Parramatta in New South Wales, then you know that this person is hungry. They're looking for peaking duck and the chances are they want to get that right now. So yeah, that's what I'd say is um, the problem with trying to match your content to all the higher search results in Google is that the chances are that everyone else has already done it. We're all very late getting to the SEO game. 
So then the question gets asked is what website builder you should be using? And this all comes down to number one, what the comfort level of you are, whether you're building it yourself or someone's building it for you and what the big ones that are used. And there's this great big sun, which has got little planets hovering around it. And that big sun is WordPress. It is representing now about 40% of all the websites on the internet. And of all those websites that are using um, these kind of systems, it represents well over 70% of the content management systems in use on the internet. So it's just so dominant compared to all the others. The second biggest one is now a bit of a tie between Joomla, which is a bit of a declining system from the early 2000s, and Wix, which is a self-hosted service that's been growing quite rapidly in the last few years. Then you've got Squarespace, which is this uh, little spidery looking black thing down here. Shopify has also been producing a lot of websites lately. Drupal, which is this um, rather freaky looking guy down here. Weebly, GoDaddy Builder, ModX, Magento, Duda, and lots of others. Once you get beyond about here, you're, well, actually, once you get beyond here, you're, about, you're down to about you know, 1% of the websites in the world. This represents about 40%. So it's much, much bigger system with much, much bigger support and people using it. I used to develop almost exclusively in the Joomla content management system. It unfortunately represents such a niche kind of people now that it's just not worth me doing it. And I work in WordPress because of that. And then I'm also working in Wix and Shopify because they're the up and coming ones. So if you're building in anything other than that, except for maybe Squarespace is probably a pretty good place to build as well. Everything else, you're just sort of locking yourself into very niche places with very niche followings and very niche companies that either you get locked into and you can't really get out of, or they're things that you can't transfer out of. Things like Weebly, for instance, you cannot transfer a Weebly site out to somewhere else unless you're doing that Weebly site within your web host. Um, same with GoDaddy. You can only do it if you've got a GoDaddy account. Duda, you can only do if you've got a Duda account. Same with Wix, Squarespace, you have to have subscriptions with them. You cannot export your sites. WordPress, you can export your site and take it somewhere else. And the same with Joomla, you can do that. And Drupal, you can do that as well. And this one, ModX, is another one you can do that in as well. So the SEO performance of each platform is based upon, number one, how easy it is for Google to read. Number two, what the tools that are built in are like and how they work. And I have to say WordPress, yes, it does lead the pack. I hate to say that because I've, I've hated it being such a dominant player for so long, but it really does. It's the most SEO friendly and SEO oriented system. Wix is doing a fantastic job of being great with SEO. They've put a lot of work into making their websites faster, much easier to use and much easier to configure when it comes to SEO stuff as well. Squarespace is pretty good as well. Drupal, not bad. Joomla is starting to sort of language towards the bottom. After you get past that, those systems that you're using are not particularly well built for search engine results. They're more so built for ease of use and for that sort of whole all-in-one um, approach that they like to take. So what you're looking for when you pick anything to build your site, and I know it seems like I'm just saying just use WordPress, but that's not necessarily the case. Wix, Squarespace are all very good systems as well. And if you're building a shop, you might find that it's actually better off for you to use something like Big Commerce or Shopify, but you are ultimately looking for a system that's going to let you create new pages and new articles very easily yourself without having to go to a web developer to do it for you. You want something that's very simple to maintain the technology, things like Wix, WordPress.com, as opposed to the one you host on your own uh, web hosting, um, Squarespace, Shopify, they do all the maintenance of the technology for you. You don't have to do any of that. You would also want to know that there's really good SEO capability built in or there's plugins that will help you to do that. WordPress has things like Yoast, which help you to have a lot more control over how you appear in Google search results. Things like Wix have their own system built in, which allows you to change how your, um, your descriptions and your titles appear in Google and helping you to optimize your site for the kind of things that people are searching for. Um, and then other areas like, for instance, um, Squarespace have that all built in as well. So there's some really good systems that are all built in to take advantage of whatever you can do yourself to be able to optimize your site for a search engine ranking. You also want very fast hosting. WordPress are brilliant at that. Squarespace are brilliant at that. Wix are brilliant at that. 
um, but not all word or well, not all web hosts are the same. If you're buying web hosting and then putting WordPress on it, you want to make sure that, that web hosting is well regarded. I've got a few that I point to all the time. Um, in Australia, I point to Ventra IP, V E N T R A I P. Um, they are very, very good and they are located in Australia, owned in Australia. And they have very fast, very highly regarded, very high rated hosting. In fact, I resell them through their wholesale arm, which is called um, Synergy, uh, Synergy Wholesale. There's also things through, for instance, um, SiteGround. SiteGround carries their traffic on the Google network. So it's really, really quick, really, really fast and performs really, really well. So SiteGround is another option, not Australian owned, but they do co-locate their servers here in Sydney. Well, in, well I'm not in Sydney, but in Sydney. And they also um, have like locations elsewhere around the world, wherever there's a Google data center, they actually have the ability to be able to have that website located really close to wherever you, you happen to have your customers. Um, others like Net Registry, GoDaddy, Crazy Domains, I just wouldn't, unless you're build, using using their own web builders. So, for instance, using the, the the Crazy Domains web builder or the GoDaddy web builder. Once you start to put things like WordPress onto their web hosting, they are absolutely atrocious. They are slow. They are clunky. They're not built to host it. So you're better off just using something that is made to host websites that need to perform very quickly. So now we've got all that technical stuff set up. We want to look at what it takes to write to be found and how to attract search results through the content that you're producing. And some of the content that performs really well are things like product pages, obviously, because people search for products online, they want to be able to find that. So if you've got really good descriptions, really good uh, titles for your products, then it's likely that they'll be found a bit more than those who are written sloppily. Blog posts and articles, I guess, are the traditional way to do it. Whilst people like to say that SEO is dead and Google search is dead and blogging is dead, it's not. It's just that people don't have the patience to work on it. They want to, they want to find the quick way forward. They want to use the clubhouses and the TikToks to, to get a quick leg up and to get ahead. That's not how Google search works. Google search works on consistency over a period of time that you are trusted to deliver the service that you deliver over a long period of time, not just three months that you've been in this latest network marketing scheme. You've got to be doing this over a period of time that's consistent. Lists perform really well. Guides and how-tos perform really well. And landing pages, which I'll have a look at very shortly. So let's look at product pages first. Number one, you've got to focus in what is in it for them, not what's so great about you. This is what we were saying before, writing your product pages for the person who's reading it, not for you to say how great you are. Um, looking at what they're going to expect, you will expect this, you have this, you are deserving this, and looking at the benefits of your product, not just the list of features. It's not like going to a car yard where they list off 50 things on a big sheet of paper that you don't even know what any of them mean. It's like saying, well, basically what this is, it just allows you to be able to, you know, smack one of the kids in the back seat with this hand while you're still holding on a coffee and driving your car with this hand. Um, just the, the, you've got to put it into the life that, that person is either leading or the life that they want to lead. And that whole thing, again, that's that Donald Miller book, that creating a story brand says a lot more about that sort of stuff. Blog posts and articles are very well handled when there's things that are like asking a question in the title. So for instance, if you're asking the question of um, if you are, um, what's the best way to drive to Litchfield National Park? And you answer that question, that's a very commonly asked question, but not so commonly answered by websites on the internet, especially around the, the top end region around Darwin. Then you answer the question in the first paragraph. So you ask a question, then you answer the question directly in the first paragraph, and then provide at least three dot points that, that support your answer. So if you say the best way to drive is straight down the Stuart Highway and turn, turn into, um, and turn into, uh Litchfield Park Road, whatever the road is, you turn in to go there. I can't even remember what it's called now. I've driven there a hundred times and I don't remember the name of it. But that's the that that needs to be backed up by three points to say this is by far the most direct route. It's also the best route for when there's floods on because there's only a very, very short little part that may get flooded. And if it does, you can just drive down the road to Crater Lake Road and that takes you in through the back of town. So those expanding those dot points, you then use subtitles to then go into the rest of it. So you've got the three dot points, then you take each dot point and expand it into another paragraph of information that makes it go a bit further and then end with a 
clear call to action. So the clear call to action could be now, now that you know how to get here, make sure you book your accommodation now so you don't miss out. That kind of thing really helps link that together. Kim's just asking what I think of Shopify hosting. Shopify has got excellent hosting. It's very fast. It's very, very geared towards what they do. They just don't give you a lot of power over your SEO and your ranking and your, and your descriptions, um, apart from what your descriptions are in the product fields and what the product name is. But the actual hosting they use is blisteringly fast for what they have in their particular system. Just don't overburden your pages with too many huge images or videos, and you'll be able to keep those pages loading nice and fast on Shopify. Lists are great because they're what we are used to in things in terms of things like listicles. Listicles are things like you see on the right, which is you know a bunch of things to do while you're visiting Alice Springs. So I found that um, if when I actually went and looked for things to do in Alice Springs, this particular thing came up from Northern Territory Tourism, which was the top 10 lists of things to do. People love a top 10 list. We love them. We love to read BuzzFeed. We love to read lists of things to do. We love to read you know the top three celebrities that we knew in the 80s which are who are look hot now we love that stuff it's clickbait and if you can make clickbait work for you it is a powerful tool it ranks really well in google as long as it's not spammy and scammy it's not those sort of three weird tricks to lose your belly fat kind of stuff we're not talking about that we're talking about things that are very specific to your business your line of work and your town and your local area so if you're in let's just say in um Leaderville in Perth and you're saying the top three cafes to go to in Leaderville and your cafe is one of them you can rank for that sort of thing cafes in Leaderville top cafes in Leaderville the best cafe in Leaderville you may be able to rank your list in there the offset of that is though that you're not just mentioning your cafe you may have to mention a couple of others as well so you might have to say hey the um the top three cafes in inner Perth you know, as opposed to the outer suburbs. And then you might be able to at least spread the load away and say, well, the, we're the top one in Leaderville, but these ones are over here in Northbridge and this one's over in, um, you know, in Mount Lawley and anywhere that's sort of around those areas, but you're not necessarily saying the ones that are right next to you are also on your list. Um, things like that involve a very short paragraph and a list of items with short descriptions, just like you can see in that example from Northern Territory Tourism. Those sort of things really rank well because they're very informative without being too over the top in terms of the length of the words. There's a very short paragraph there and it's just saying what you need to say to get someone interested enough to click that link to go and visit where the Olive Pink Botanical Gardens are. So, Think, think about it. What could you write a top 10 about? What are the things that you could make lists about that could actually help people to find your website when they're looking for things to do or things to buy, coffee shops, places to eat, attractions to go and follow. Guides and how-tos are also really good. Things that, that describe how to get to, how to cool down, the guide to Aranda culture, what humbugging is and how to deal with the four wheel drive guides at East Arnhem land, the top, the, the guides to know how to get a good consistent coffee from a, from a barista who's in a bad mood. Any of those sort of how to kind of articles are going to help you to get those search results as well. So it's not just a matter of writing blogs. It's a matter of being smart with the blogs that you're writing. You're writing. We're not saying to write blogs these days. We're saying to write content that's compelling that people actually want to read. And to do that, you need to provide the answers to the questions that people have and put it in a format that's really, really super easy for them to be able to scan over and get the information they need really quick and then get back out again, or the stuff that Google is actually looking for because there is a, a shortage of good information on that particular topic. So what could you write a guide about? What are you close to? What's your local area? What are the things that you know about your area that you could be an expert on? Is there things that you do in your business? Are you a steel worker who has a particular um, you know, affinity to working with a particular, maybe Damascus steel, and you know how to produce it and you know how to work with it and you know how to describe it? Then that could be something that someone's looking for when they're looking for Damascus steel. You can then put that in description in there and saying, we work with Damascus steel and actually repair Damascus steel knives and, and cutting implements, that sort of thing. Landing pages then are a bit of a special case because they usually are a very much a one-off page that's designed for no other reason but to get 
people searching and finding you in Google. So that could be things that relate to a trend or to a news topic or a specific topic or a very specific demographic. Examples for someone who, let's just, well, I've got an example here. This is a landing page for people who went and saw the movie Top End Wedding and wanted to go and visit the places that have to do with that, all the locations that are, um, are, are, are mentioned in that movie. So your landing page could be that um, you want to take the Back to the Future tour of all the retro places in town. Um, you can then say, okay, as featured on Getaway, uh, that can be a really good way of looking at it. A landing page that is um, geared towards an event that happens in your town. Let's just say you're, uh, it's during the Fest of the Carnival of Flowers in Toowoomba. I think it's still on. I think it's still something they do in Toowoomba. If not, I'm totally out of time. But if there's a Carnival of Flowers or the Flower Festival in Toowoomba, then you could then leverage yourself as being something to do with that. You're not saying that you're sponsoring it. You're not saying you're part of it. You're not saying you're the organizer of it. You're just saying while you're in town, the things that you can things that you can shop for whilst you're in Toowoomba visiting for the Carnival of Flowers. So you can say, okay, you can go shopping at this little boutique that we happen to own. You can go shopping at this little jewelry store, which we happen to own. You can go drinking coffee at this particular cafe that friends of ours own. And that way you're tying into other things that people are searching for in your area and associating yourself with them. That is always a guaranteed way of getting extra traffic coming into Google. So what think about it, what are the landing pages that you could possibly produce? So I built a landing page once upon a time for um, way to, it was a bit of a how-to landing page. And my landing page was all about how to read, how to target people with ads and Facebook that are members of particular groups. And the whole thing was that I needed to be a member of that group and it helps if I'm an admin of that group. But if I'm not, I can still post a video on that group that's relevant to that group and then retarget the, the viewers of those videos. So to do that though, um, I've, got a, I've got an article on my website that's the top rating one in the world for that particular query. And I get 1000 visitors a week just to that article. So what I'm trying to do is now associate myself with more of those questions that are very similar to that. So I can get more of that traffic coming through. And if I can get that, it's actually increasing the, val the, the, the value of my website to the point where everything else on my website is now starting to rank higher and higher every week as I continue to continue to get that thousand people coming through to my website every week who are looking for answers to these questions. Backlinks are all about developing a referral network of traffic from one place to a different place. So the valuable sources of backlinks are the play, things that will assist you to be found, are things like having yourself listed on the, on the members of a chamber of commerce. That is a very powerful tool. I'm not going to lie to you. It may not be cheap, but it is a very good way of making sure that you are mentioned in a very high authority place that then links back to you popular online magazines and blogs, when they link back to you, they're useful. Your social media profile links. So in Facebook, when you list what your actual, um, what your, um, your, oh, it's got so easily distracted then, but I saw something outside that was actually like a car crash. <laughs> I just got really, really distracted. Your social media profile link is the, the, the address of your website that's in your Facebook profile, not in a post, but it's actually in the about section of your profile. Also listing that information in your YouTube and also then putting your website address into your YouTube descriptions for videos that you're putting on there is also very helpful. If you can get a link on a government site, go for it because honestly, one link on a government's website is like a thousand links on non-government websites websites. Once you have that link through, it really helps you to get more traffic. Forums, wikis, other websites, other blogs, they're really good for getting those backlinks from as long as they're related to what you're doing. Bad sources of backlink are those sort of link build link building sites and directories and farms that no one uses, things like Hot Frog and, you know, Pink Directory and all those different sort of places which they don't really have any traffic. No one actually uses them, but they, you know, have links and links and links and lists and lists and lists of people. And they um, will often accept money for you to have extra places in their links. Um, don't use them. They don't work. Unrelated forums. So forums for, say, Star Trek fans and you're trying to sell coffee. Unrelated, not going to help you at all. Google's smart enough to work out what's related and what's not. Um, the automated posting of links to blog comments is actually going to come up against you and you don't want that to happen. Google won't necessarily penalize you, 
they're just not going to promote you. They're just going to promote everyone else over you. Um, articles on websites that are unrelated to what you do. So for instance, if you are a travel related business and you are in a magazine about, I don't know, um, guns and ammo, then, and you don't have anything to do with tours involving hunting or fishing or anything like that, then you're totally unrelated and it's totally unhelpful. And duplicate content on your own website. It doesn't actually matter for you to have duplicate content on different websites, but if you have duplicate content on, um, on the one site, that will help your rank to drop and other people to come in over the top. Neutral sources of backlinks, they're good to have because they generate traffic, but they're otherwise not really going to give you any help to be found in Google is things like Facebook posts, LinkedIn posts, Pinterest pins, TikTok videos, Instagram posts. They do not help you to be found in Google, but they do help you to generate more traffic from those locations through your website. So they don't really give you a lot of SEO value apart from giving you a little bit of extra traffic. And if you can continue getting lots of traffic from Facebook, hey, use it. So when you're looking at these things, you can check out your website's backlinks. You might want to take a screenshot of this at ahrefs.com backlink dash checker. That's going to help you to check what other, um, what locations that your backlinks are coming from. So you can see if there's good ones, bad ones, ones that you've never heard of. Chances are you're going to see a few in there. You're going to, I don't know why these people are listing me, but they seem to be. Understand the difference between good neutral and bad bank links and avoid the bad ones and try to get more good ones. And then look at how you might want to develop a few more links back to your website as well. I'll just answer that quick question from Wendy, who um, was asking, how does a landing page differ from blog articles and SEO? Basically, they don't. They're pretty much seen as the same thing. The difference is that often how things are written. People in blogs tend to write very flowery language, and they tend to take a long time to get to the point. If you can get to the point very quickly in a blog, that's essentially like a landing page. The major difference between a landing page traditionally and a blog is that a blog is a part of a website. A landing page could be detached from a website and sit completely separate from it because honestly it doesn't need all the links at the top and all the menu bars it doesn't need to be mentioning all the other stuff around it or the junk drawer that's down at the bottom with all the links going to other pages it's like that page is only there for one purpose and one purpose alone and that's to get someone to act on it to book a meeting or to book a call or to make a call or to buy something that's actually on that page. So that's the main difference between landing pages and blog articles is that landing pages are usually seen as a standalone page that's only about what's on that page, whereas a blog is usually part of a much broader website and is linked through to lots of other blog posts as well. My final part of this particular series is called Stay Known, which is all about uh, graphics and video. We're going to look at how to make them, look at the well, um, how user generated content works, how creating moments in Instagram can work and some ideas for how you can do that as well. It's taking all these things we've done over the last few weeks and turning them into something that you can apply to your business, your website and use these creative tools to do so much better. I'd like to thank you so much for joining me this afternoon or this evening. It's time for you to go off to get dinner. It would be time for me to get dinner, but unfortunately, I've got another call to make tonight before I can pack it in. So if you'd like to get in touch with me at all, Dante at treaty.com.au is the place to get hold of me. Um, I like answering SEO questions because they're quite easy to answer for me. Uh, I do a lot of this stuff and continue to do it. And it's an area that I'm very interested in because I can be quite a competitive little mite. And you can follow me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, all those. I'd love to see you there. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel you're seeing this on, whether it's Business Station or my Dante St. James one. This one will be up in the next hour. So thank you so much and have an awesome night. You've been awesome to chat too. Thanks for the great questions as well. So much more fun when people actually ask questions. Have a great one.